Hello, everybody. OK, it's on. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I am Corrado Biscitelli. He's Adriano Delia. Uh, we work for Man Entertainment, an animation studio in Naples, Italy. Uh, I am a technical director. He's a technical artist. And this is setting up a custom pipeline with context properties and geonodes. As you can see, these are some of our projects. And our first feature film, The Art of Happiness, the, the one in the top left corner of this image, uh, although it was a mixed 2D, 3D production, was mainly 2D. However, from our second feature film onward, that is uh, Cinderella the Cat, we fully transitioned to uh, a 3D pipeline. Now I'm going to show you uh, a brief showreel of our most significant project so that you can, if you don't know us, you can see something. Uh, cool. <laughs> Thank you. What does it mean to transition to a full 3D pipeline? It meant that we, um, first we had all these composing nodes and leader shader nodes. And as you saw, we, during the years, we maintained a strong 2D oriented aesthetic. In fact, we, with 3D, we used to extract all these render passes that you see on the left part of this image and then do an extensive post-production work. We had to change and invert that <laughs> and with Foot Wizards. Our first animated series for Rai, the most important broadcaster in our country, uh, this approach was too time consuming. We didn't have time to do that, all that post-processing. So we decided to use Eevee, taking advantage of its power for NPR aesthetics. As you can see here, we went from having a more complex compositing node system and a simpler shading node system to the exact opposite. What are we going to talk about here? You know, Blender as a software has evolved a lot. And with new features, we've often had to make some compromises. In this talk, we will discuss pipeline, NPR, geometry nodes, EV, and a touch of individual craziness for our approach on things. To start, these are the things we've had to focus on the most uh, over time. We had to find our NPR look and define what we needed to use to get to it. We so then had to uh, develop our shaders, try to make it work for a, mm, a big production for a TV series with many, many minutes to uh, produce, having to control the shadings for that 2D aesthetic, and then having to make it work in EV with what we knew from our previous productions. Let's start with our NPR look. What do we need to achieve our NPR look? After much consideration, what we needed the most was to separate lighting control between set and characters. Custom render passes like the cavity pass from Workbench, advanced control over normals, because in 2D you need to flatten things, animated characters with variable frame rate and camera movement on ones, and multi tail uh, line art. For the first point, since there is no like link in, in Eevee for now, as of 4.2, we need to work what we have. We use the technique of separating lights into R RGB channels using red lights as rim lights, green as the main light, and blue as light specifics for the set. Uh, this solves most of our needs, though, of course, light linking would offer more options. For the second point, we had to do some research to understand how Workbench calculates the cavity pass and replicate its mechanism as much as possible. For the third point, we developed several geometry nodes to flatten our characters when necessary, both by smoothing normals and physically reducing the thickness of the geometries. For the fourth point, we started from the mm, reasoning done by Conan Winch on YouTube. If you've seen his videos, go pay him a visit. 
and then wrapped everything in a geometry node that applies the process automatically, sort of. Finally, to achieve a more detailed line art, we created a geometry node that links additional geometry uh, used to draw extra lines to our characters. Kind of like uh, a surface deform modifier, but not quite. Allowing these lines to follow the character's animation. Now, uh, I'm going to give the word to Adriano for shader development. Thank you. Hi. So, shader development. In an NPR production, it is often to control the shading of individual assets in the animation or render scene. Uh, in the worst case scenario, uh, you might want to control every aspect of, uh, of an air shader. Uh, so to make this uh, more manageable also during the lighting, uh, the rendering pass, etc., uh, it's essential to, to build with uh, um, some uh, submodels that can be reused also to uh, shared across uh, different uh, shaders. Uh, and so uh, with uh, uh, less uh, submodel, you can create um, more uh, shading. Uh, as I previously mentioned, uh, the base of our, of our shader uses the RGB system uh, to separate the lights, so we create a light selector to reuse it uh, multiple times uh, within the shader. Uh, this because, for example, we are used to uh, take the uh, red channel uh, from uh, this selector for the rim light, and for example, for the, rim, uh, for the main light, uh, the green channel. So with uh, a unique uh, um, sh uh, shading nodes, uh, a unique node group, uh, we can uh, easily control and create different uh, light types. So you can see uh, the little S uh, light select from here, and um, from there uh, we defined the, the, all the parameters that definitely uh, needed to be controlled and exposed, such as base color, grading, depth, pro procedural texture, transparency, reflection, etc. So you can uh, build with uh, these little uh, uh, node groups all the, the, um, the shading, the basing shade that we need to, uh, to build uh, a complete shading uh, node. Uh, knowing that uh, certain pa uh, custom paths would be useful uh, in the compositing phase, we also added in this uh, phase uh, some module, some of uh, the paths during uh, the, the shading. Uh, so uh, you can see that we have uh, also an, another group called SHAOV. Uh, that contain all the, the AOV that we need uh, um, for the character and for the set. Uh, also, uh, the, that how uh, uh, we use also as a uh, debugging tool. It's really useful. And then we have um, um, studying uh, which, uh, um, which we need to, uh, to achieve uh, as uh, our look. We just see also uh, the uh, Wingit uh, latest short from uh, Blender Foundation, and we admire and appreciate the great uh, work done with uh, combining shader and geometry nodes. Uh, since the production uh, film are available online, uh, we studied some of the techniques uh, used and found certain elements in common with our artistic vision, especially uh, in the use of a 2D uh, rim light. We used the node group created by Simon to achieve a rim light with a more cartoonish style, which our shader references uh, via an attribute node, uh, improving the quality of uh, the rim light itself. And uh, so, for this reason, we thank uh, Simon, <laughs> first of all, and then all the Blender Foundation for all the resources, and we strongly suggest uh, to see uh, on the site cloud.blender.org if uh, you need something, you can find really a lot of resources, also uh, for inspiration and uh, so, so to, to understand how pipeline maybe uh, could be better for you. <clears throat> Once the basic shader modules were created, the material is then assembled and customized directly within the asset file. Uh, and in fact, we have all the shader, all the singular shader that we built uh, previously uh, linked in the, the asset file, and then with all this shader, we can build the main uh, shader. For example, we can have a shader and a material with, without reflection because we don't need it, and then another one with reflection or glossy and, uh, and so on. 
so, in conclusion, we have created a system that allows us to manage the uh, shader in detail. And uh, again, I leave the, the, the word to Corrado. Okay. I'm back here to talk to you about linked asset management. So what happens when you have that shader and you want to uh, use it? How do you deploy it in production? In our productions, uh, I, I think this is fairly common, but just to be uh, clear, I say in our productions, each animation file is built by linking a character and set collection from separate files. This allows us uh, to automatically update the assets through production and enables different stages of work to start simultaneously. We can have uh, not a complete modeling phase with uh, basic rig to start our animations and then work on the models and complete them when the animation needs them to be on another stage. Or maybe we need to do texturing afterwards. This is pretty uh, standard things. Uh, typically, shading and related controls are defined at a more advanced stage because you don't need them during animation. They can be even heavy sometimes. So they can be added only when necessary. In the past, we updated the character leak directly to include bones that control the shading. But with the different versions of Blender, the method of controlling rigs from linked assets has changed, particularly when transitioning from proxies to overrides, uh, which caused us some unforeseen difficulties. Fortunately, thanks to the greater versatility uh, of overrides and the expansion of context properties, I cannot stress this enough, we were able to achieve much more than we had before. As you can see here, uh, proxies allowed multiple assets to share the same material and shading controls. For example, a prop held by a character uh, could share the same material controlled by the character's rig, even if it was in a different file. With overrides, however, duplicates are created uh, that point to different rigs. What happens usually is that uh, when you try to make an override of the prop A, it, uh, since it's linked to another uh, rig from another file, it will duplicate that too. As a result, we had to change our approach and completely separate the material rig from the asset rig it was linked to. But how can you control multiple materials linked from different files with a single rig? We did that using context properties and specific drivers. Uh, with this little um, trick, we managed to separate the asset and its rig from the material rig. In fact, we opened up many, much, uh, many more possibilities since the rig can now be created directly in the scene as the whole system is name-based. Another advantage of this method is the ability to link animation collections in a separate render file, which is automatically updated as the animation progress. Uh, so we took it one step further. We, not, we didn't just separate modeling and animation. We could uh, make, start, uh, make them start uh, together as animation and render too. Essentially, the system works like this. I have to make it slow because this is actually a little confusing sometimes. Shading node groups are in the shader node or in the shading node file and they are linked to each character that has the actual material inside. The material is in the character, but it's linked uh, to the shader nodes. Then the character collection is obviously linked in the animation file, okay? And both as a whole, the whole um, animation file collection is linked into the render file that has the actual shader controls. The shader controls are then in the render file. It can control the shading properties of each material. In something like this. <laughs> I know this might look like a dependency cycle, but using context properties, we can easily avoid it because they are not pointing to a rig into that file from the start. They are pointing at a file that has that name that exists in a file. So in conclusion, we have both recovered the functions we needed from proxies and unlocked new potential thanks to how overrides work. So let's continue with shading controls. This is how uh, our shading control system works. As you can see here, uh, we have pointers, basically. They point to things. It can be an empty, it can be a, a full rig with bones. So our shading rigs are created in the character file originally, where the shader properties are linked to attribute nodes that point to a specific object in the current file, or more accurately in the view layer, because that's the context property actually pointed to, 
and are then imported in the render file. They are appended there, they are not uh, linked. So the character material, when linked in render file, will automatically be controlled by the object in the current view layer that now is in the render file. You may wonder, why not use a driver? Uh, drivers have several disadvantages, disadvantages <laughs> in this case. If they point to a specific object, uh, uh, when that asset is linked, it will attempt to link that specific ob object as well, undermining the goal of using a single con rig to control multiple uh, materials. Even if we create a driver that points to a context properties, because you can do that, uh, thus avoiding the shading rig being brought along, any modification would require us to exit the shader editor and make changes in the driver's editor, which leads us to point three. Often drivers do not update as we want them to. <laughs> I don't know if you have ever tried to click that update dependencies button many times without having what you expected it to happen, but it does what it is expected to happen, it's just not what you wanted, probably. Uh, so you can do that with scripts uh, or um, trying to change your UI a bit to have to click around, but it can be a hassle. We would love to eliminate drivers as much as possible in this specific um, setup, but for some things we had to keep them for a while longer. Uh, specifically in Blender version 4.1 we were forced to use empty objects to manage parameters because there was a limit to the number of characters in attribute nodes which fortunately we requested to be increased in 4.2, uh, thanks to uh, Ilya Katushinok. I don't know if he's here, and, but thank you. <laughs> Ideally, we would like to manage everything we need between the shader editor and the geometry nodes editor, but for now, this works fine. Therefore, our shader looks something like this. Uh, that node that you see on the left, this one, uh, is simply a collection of attribute nodes. So we created a script that allows us to change all the script, all the strings contained in it. As you see, there's a lot because every input is a context property. Uh, so you, you, with that script, we just, we just uh, push of a button, you can change all the names uh, and point it to a different trick. So by leveraging the power of context properties, we were able to create drivers for our geometry nodes that are linked to custom parameters in the scene or view layer. And Adriano will now discuss it further with you. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, as you can understand, we are rendering with Divi right now. <laughs> so we have to understand uh, before what's the differences uh, between the cycles and Divi. Uh, what, uh, what we can achieve with the cycles uh, and what we are missing with Divi, what we can try to recreate in Divi. Uh, in the past, in fact, we primarily used the cycles for our renders and the Blender internal for viewport visualization. Uh, cycles allowed us to export different render paths passes uh, separately uh, and create render layers with global material overrides to achieve our NPR look uh, in uh, compositing. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Eevee does not have the same render passes uh, and there is no direct way to do material overrides. Uh, additionally, indirect only uh, cannot be used, uh, so we had to find an alternative, an alternative solution. But anyway, Eevee, we have to consider that uh, uh, we have with uh, um, unique uh, render engine, uh, both the, the uh, viewport visualization and the final render. Things that uh, con cycles, uh, with cycles you uh, can do it, uh, because you can have a, a viewport, a faster viewport. Uh, so, uh, after adjusting our approach, we still had some, t some uh, compositing needs. Uh, first of all, we needed to separate character and set, uh, while maintaining the character shadows uh, as if they, are, uh, if they were uh, present, meaning we needed a way to achieve something similar to indirect only. Uh, we needed also better management uh, of our Vs, uh, which allowed us to meet many of the needs related to the render passes, but uh, are somewhat limited when transparency also needs to be managed. And uh, we need uh, um, to manage the lights for characters and set individually. Uh, the keyword for all of these is uh, geometry nodes. Uh, once we understood the potential of context properties related to the view layers, it didn't take uh, long to create a geometry nodes that can change the material based on the view layer, allowing us to have 
uh, a material override that is even more, even more powerful than cycles uh, because it's uh, no longer global. Uh, since uh, we can uh, uh, in um, in a single uh, uh, we, we can have uh, this uh, this little node that, that you can uh, uh, see on the on the right uh, we have uh, this uh, geometry nodes called uh, uh, material switch that is on the mesh so you can change different material between the mesh so you can have a view layer that change the material to all uh, to all the mesh or uh, to see uh, to determinated uh, uh, meshes and uh, to do this uh, if you can see on the bottom uh, right you can see that there is uh, these three uh, custom properties that are created on the view layer uh, tab so this means that when you change the uh, view layer also uh, this parameter can be uh, changed so you can have for example as you can see here a parameter uh, ch uh, ch chair and uh, set different between the, the set so this is the the main uh, uh, work of this uh, uh, this note but uh, it's uh, pretty powerful since uh, you have also more option and um, the same concept applied also to the shading creation phase uh, has also been implemented uh, in compositing uh, since uh, you can create uh, modules and uh, we, all, we not only gain greater control over the, uh, the resulting uh, style but we also simplify usage for those uh, who are not uh, too expert um, many of these modules utilizes uh, AUVs to achieve better control um, as uh, previ previously mentioned, uh, we created a view normal pass to replicate the cavity effect uh, from workbench. So this, uh, this node group uh, is created, uh, as you can see here, uh, is uh, an input that is um, the view normal pass that is fundamental for uh, uh, after a long research <laughs> we understand that it is really fundamental to create a cavity a cavity pass or a curvature i don't know how you, how you want to call it uh, but the uh, useful things in this case that uh, you can have uh, you can have in uh, during the compositor uh, during the compositing phase also uh, the parameter that you can change uh, and you can tweak uh, without uh, go to uh, again to the 3d viewport and re-render that pass with the workbench uh, i'm saying this because uh, um, before of this method uh, we used uh, the uh, duplicated scene of the workbench uh, with uh, only cavity enabled and we can um, composite it uh, during the compositing but uh, as I can see as I said before if you have to change or tweak some parameter you have to uh, re-render that passes so you can have uh, you can see in real time what the passes uh, has done then uh, to further expand our uh, use of our viz we utilize a noise texture as an input uh, for a vector displacement node um, which allows us to achieve a frame with the regular edge uh, the texture is applied to, to in, uh, in the viewport as our viz uh, um, so during the compositing uh, you don't have uh, the fixed uh, texture that uh, um, can slide on top of the, uh, the the frame but you have the this noise texture as you can see from the uh, from the background uh, the, that's, uh, that follow the camera movements so you don't uh, you don't see uh, that slide this uh, as I said before, uh, this can be possible only uh, with, uh, um, with an OV from the 3D, with a uh, 3D material uh, such as this. Uh, so an, a simple noise texture inputted as uh, OV output. Speaking, speaking of uh, camera movement, at the beginning of the talk, uh, we mentioned the need for uh, characters and camera movements to be uh, variable rates. Um, when using a variable rates and moving both and, uh, character and camera, the character movement uh, appears choppy uh, when uh, moving at a frame rate lower than that uh, of the camera. 
In this case, we decided to leverage the power of a geometry node, specifically using a simulation node, uh, to take the characters collection and calculate its displacement uh, um, its translation when uh, it is uh, stationary while uh, the camera is in motion. So you can uh, see really, <laughs> pretty obvious, <laughs> anyway, pretty obvious uh, uh, what's the difference. Uh, because of course, if uh, we can see uh, this frame by frame, you can see that uh, there is a moment in which uh, the, the character is, uh, uh, is freezed, but uh, the camera still moving on, on the left in, the, in this case. So uh, this uh, creates this choppy effect. And uh, the camera compensation, as we called, uh, I don't know if it's uh, the real name, of the <laughs> but but <laughs> the camera compensation that we create uh, uh, make uh, the, this little shift on the character, on the, all the character mesh, uh, along the movement of the, uh, the camera. Uh, we also pre previously mentioned a geometry node compression, uh, uh, a geometry node to flatten uh, the geometry. Um, I want to explain better this, but uh, as you can see from the uh, from the preview, from the video, uh, sometimes uh, you only uh, tweaking the normals, you can achieve a real, a really two uh, D um, look because, uh, of course, you can, when you um, edit normals, uh, you can change the self shadow, but not the casted shadow because, of course, the casted shadows are calculated on the, the 3D, 3D volumetries, uh, so uh, the 3D geometry. So if uh, there is uh, that geometry with that uh, width, you, can't, uh, you, you can have only the casted shadow uh, geometrically corrected, let me see. Uh, and uh, so in this case, we can uh, also tweak uh, uh, this, uh, and of course we added some little uh, features like uh, uh, this that you can see right now. It's useful when, uh, not in this case, but for example, when you see uh, the, um, the foot of your character, for example, so uh, you have the character that are moving and set uh, no. Uh, so you can see uh, the, uh, the flatten also on uh, the foot, and sometimes it can happen that is uh, strange, uh, it can have uh, something uh, weird movement. So you can uh, uh, delete, uh, based on an empty, based on a gradient, uh, you can delete some parts of this deformation. And of course, uh, this is also relative to a uh, specific, this uh, flattening is also relative to a specific uh, uh, origin that uh, there is uh, used uh, with another uh, empty. Of course, I didn't see it, but uh, it is uh, uh, related to the camera view. In fact, uh, uh, let me... Can go back. Yes, let me <laughs> go back. Uh, if you can see... It's not moving. Okay, uh, if you can see uh, when I am flattening, uh, it doesn't change anything to the camera on the, to the view camera on the, on the left, but uh, uh, you can only see uh, the shadow that changed. Then, um, any NPR pipeline, uh, let me see, need a proper uh, line art. So <laughs> we need also uh, that feature. Uh, and uh, um, the line art uh, is really uh, great powerful, the line art from object or collection uh, really need a, a great results. But sometimes, uh, as you can see here, we need also to add uh, some details. Mm, I just added uh, right now this, uh, <laughs> not the really detail of the character, this. <laughs> but anyway, these are uh, some example. So if uh, I need to add some detail on the, on the character, I need also uh, that this detail would convert as, a, let me see, as a grease pencil. So uh, the, this can um, be uh, done with the line art, but uh, we need that this, uh, uh, this detail need to follow the deformation of the character. So we added uh, another 
uh, another geometry, uh, just to change, uh, another geometry to insert also uh, this uh, deformation that can follow our geometry. Uh, in this case, in particular, he has done with uh, uh, some differences between the animation collection uh, compared to the rest pose collection. Uh, there is also a rest position parameter that can be also used, uh, but right now we are using this and uh, as you can see it's work and uh, you don't need uh, to, uh, for example, uh, as uh, surface uh, deform will do, uh, you don't need to bind and unbind every time you make uh, a change. So if uh, you can see uh, when it's already binded, well, let me see, when it's already done, I can, uh, as you can see in a in a moment, you can also delete some, uh, some edge and uh, return back and it's still following uh, the, the deformed mesh. Um, then, this is it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for watching. <laughs> We're here for, if you have questions, we're here. Uh, we can go back and re-explain something if we were not clear enough. Uh, so uh, ask away if you need. <laughs> Do you want the microphone? Oh, thank you. So I used uh, geometry nodes, for example, when I wanted to, the good thing about geometry nodes is that you can have your settings on the right side of your screen, for example, because you have the geometry nodes modify on the right, and then you can, for example, controls, control the colors oh. of a character, for example. Going backwards. <laughs> so uh, is it, was it this one? Or uh, yeah, exactly. Where you can see the right side, the modifiers. Mm -hmm. You can, you know, then plug the output of or the input of that uh, into the input node of the geometry nodes. Mm -hmm. And then on the right, you can see all the settings that you can then work through. These you can then adjust the shader, for example, by saving it as a color attribute, for example. Yeah. You can then feed it into the shader, and then you yes. can. Yes. Something I ran into is that Eevee has a limit for uh, attributes. Have you found a way, or what, have you? Did you run into that too, and did you find a good way to go around that, or yeah? <laughs> this is for, for you. <laughs> uh, say if you can repeat the last part uh, for which the question. So or basically, the yeah. yeah, the um, at least for geometry node attributes, there's a limit in Eevee that Eevee can kind of take from the geometry nodes. I think and for me it was around two geometry nodes and then use it in shaders. In yes. It's limited sometimes, the so how can, did we work I around? <laughs> I think, uh, yeah. I don't know if it's uh, really limited. The, the main problem is that uh, it's EV right now, I think, because uh, geometry nodes uh, write attribute on vertices. So when uh, you uh, when you have a lot of uh, attribute, uh, this can be really heavy, uh, but uh, you can uh, use that attribute uh, as a vector, for example, as a float, I don't know uh, what is actually... I, I can yeah. answer part of this question. For example, in the uh, camera compensate nodes, mm -hmm. okay, no, not, uh, not this one, okay, yes. this one. <laughs> in this camera compensate node, uh, since it's using uh, simulation nodes, everything is uh, joined together. This is not the original mesh, it is a duplicate of that mesh uh, simulated with geometry nodes. What happens is the that the uh, the mesh loses all vertex colors, and um, if you have multiple materials, you can't reassign them to the faces that were assigned to the single pieces. So we had to make one big shader that contained every property uh, that you needed to use. So that's why we built them with modules so that we could use the same material with modules and use masks to define differences. That's how we partially worked around that because if you don't, if you can't take a custom property from the geometry nodes, you have to <laughs> circle around it somehow. Okay, yeah. We noticed sometimes uh, that uh, some of our solutions were, um, since he just this is just the first day of the conference and there's already studios <laughs> sharing what they're doing with their productions. And, and this is the, the third talk today <laughs> that yes. talked about uh, talks, uh, NPR productions. And we all had the same needs. Uh, uh, somebody uses different approaches, but 
uh, even for this uh, geometry compression node, we saw another variation uh, this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, and for the camera compensated, it is the same technique that you that you saw in Spider Verse to have the characters not seem choppy on the moving um, uh, on the moving cameras around. And so it is uh, pretty important to to notice that we are using Blender Vanilla. We don't use you know, any different version. So this is everything you can do on your own easily uh, just by understanding how the method works. For the uh, custom properties, for example, you just have to input them. You have to create them and make point to that. It's just easier than that you can, you can do it. And for the geometry nodes, it depends on the, <laughs> the user, obviously, because they can be quite complex. So you have to uh, find ways, but uh, we could package it into nodes and probably in time, I think in uh, the Blender um, res online resources, the um, extensions, thank you. <laughs> Blender extensions, you, in, in, I think it's in a little time, you'll find many of these nodes that do this stuff that's actually needed for many productions. Uh, for example, uh, as uh, Corrado said before, also the great things is uh, that uh, you can talk with the Blender development, uh, developer. Yes. So, uh, for example, sometimes, of course, we find some limitation, but we can ask if in the next version maybe could be uh, changed something. So, uh, in uh, the case, I don't know if you have uh, here. I wanted to move. <laughs> uh, for example, uh, that limitation that uh, we have on the attribute node uh, string length that uh, really uh, is uh, a waste of time for us because we had to uh, to make a double passage to uh, to arrive uh, at our properties when uh, with a length string of the attribute node we can point directly to the Basically, to the bone I can try to show it and here uh, just to contextualize it so it's easier as you see here these nodes on the the, the red nodes on the left are all attribute nodes and in Blender 4.1, we didn't have enough characters to just make it point directly to um, an armature. We had to use empties because the, the string for objects empty and, and then the custom property is much shorter than uh, object, the name of the rig, pose, dot bones, the name of the bone, and then the custom property. We didn't have enough characters. We just asked to change it and it was instantaneous, it's just yeah. the, the next version it was fixed. Yeah. Uh, so this means that if you have specific needs, the foundation is always ready to uh, welcome it and it, it really changes things when you have uh, this powerful connection with them. So everybody should try it and ask. Yes. <laughs> so if nobody needs to ask us anything, I think we're basically done. Yeah, done. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you.